Hello everybody, my name is Melanie Harwood and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Educate Global. And with me today is one of the most exciting special speakers of this entire summit. I saw this lady delivering this talk um, on Saturday night, very late on another group. And I cried when they told me it had not been recorded. So I, I'm very lucky that I tracked her down and I said, Francisca, I need you to do it all again because I've got to get this out in front of all of the Educate Global Award schools around the world. So I'm gonna let Francisca introduce herself. And when you listen and you watch what she's going to be showing you today, you'd best be sitting down because this is groundbreaking stuff. This is the solution, a solution to the climate emergency. One of the many we need, we need lots of them, but here's one that is gonna blow you all away. Francisca, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, and thank you for this amazing introduction. I'm Francisca Elmer. I am a research fellow at the School for Field Studies in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And I'm also one of the hosts of the Sargassum podcast which you guys should all check out after you listen to our talk, because you will want to know a lot more about this algae. But for now, I would like to share a few slides with you to talk about sargassum and why I'm so crazy about it to start a podcast just on this algae. When did you start going crazy over, over algae? Um, I started, it started all in um, 2018 when the sargassum got, um, got really bad on the island I, I was teaching. And, and so I started researching it and then I realized that it is killing our, our sea grasses. And and then uh, we had people visiting who said that we could make stuff out of this to help climate change. And I was hooked for life. <laughs> right. I can't wait. Here we go. All right. So my, my talk is called Sargassum Catastrophe or Opportunity. Um, first of all, I would like to show you all this graphic. What you see flaring up here are macroalgae blooms, which is also called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. So you can see every summer you have this very red um, belt, a yellow red belt going through the entire Atlantic from West Africa all the way to Mexico and Florida. And in 2018, which is coming up in a second, this was the biggest macroalgae bloom that we ever had in the world with 20,000 tons of biomass. And this is what I wanna to talk to you about today. So you understand better how this came about and what we can do about it. So let me tell me you first about what algae is actually in this bloom. It is this beautiful looking algae called sargassum. Actually, it's only three of the sargassum species. There's over 350 of them, but these three are never attached to the bottom. So their life is normal like this, floating free in the ocean, going with the currents. You can see little bubbles on the sargassum and those bubbles have air in, the, in them and make them float. After a while with the sun and everything else, the sargassum of course degrades and some of those bubbles um, pop and the sargassum sinks to the bottom naturally and becomes part of the sediment. Normally, or for a very long time, the sargassum was mainly found in the Sargasso Sea, which is 
in the middle of the Atlantic or the northern Atlantic. Um, Bermuda is in that Sargasso Sea area, and it's the only sea without a coast. Um, small parts of it will get out of this gyre, which keeps the sargassum together, and go into the Caribbean. And the Gulf of Mexico used to have a bit of a sargassum problem because of um, it growing there um, with the Mississippi out, outflow. But then it would travel back into the Sargasso Sea, where it's a really, really important ecosystem. So this is what the sargassum looks like in the Sargasso Sea and offshore. You can see it's full of life. There is fish, there's turtles, there's critters, there is birds. So there's a lot of small animals in there. And these small animals attract smaller fish, and these attract bigger fish. And these bigger fish even attract fishermen. And it's a whole ecosystem, also sometimes called the rainforest of the sea. Sargassum is extremely important to sea turtles. Um, when the little hatchlings get off the beach to spend several years in the open ocean, the so-called lost years, they often spend it in sargassum. It's a great hiding spot. The turtles pretty much have the same color as the sargassum. They have food and they can bask in the sun on top of the sargassum rather than to have to swim the whole time. So it's a perfect nursery for them. That is why the sargasso sea was um, made a special, uh, was, is protected now. There's the Sargasso Sea Commission that has been fighting for this for several years. And the Hamilton Declaration, which protects the Sargasso Sea and the sargassum inside of it, has been signed by 10 different countries. And here you can just see some of the animals you, can, you find in the sargassum. But what happened um, from the Sargasso Sea that we now have this great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. It all started in 2009-2010. In that winter, the Northern Atlantic Oscillation was very extreme and not very strong. And that made it possible for Sargassum to leave the Sargasso Sea and move um, towards the, the east towards Gibraltar. There it, uh, um, it ended up in spring 2010, and then normal conditions returned, and it started moving downward into the um, equatorial Atlantic. Down here in the equatorial Atlantic, there's lots of sun, the ocean is warm, and there's nutrient upwelling in the middle and a lot of nutrients coming from the Amazon River. So that's when the sargassum could reproduce like crazy and then move into both, um, move east to, to Africa and move west into the Caribbean. And now this is our new normal. We always have a little sargassum patch here in the Atlantic and every summer, um, around March, actually, it starts. It starts reproducing and moving into those two directions with the biggest um, part, like it being at its biggest size normally in July and then um, getting smaller again by November. So, so really what caused this to happen is human influences and the environmental change we have made. It's um, the melting of the sea ice due to climate change. It's the heating of the oceans also due to climate change. And it's all those nutrients we are pumping into the ocean, especially through the Amazon River, because we are converting um, what used to be a forest into agricultural land and use fertilizers and agrochemicals on it. So unfortunately, now this is also what sargassum looks like. 
This is a picture from Mexico. And it shows how the sargassum now lands on our beaches and coasts. And when it is at its most extreme, it can be knee to hip high. And these people here are removing the sargassum as best as they can. And you can see they are all wearing scarves. Because the sargassum is a health hazard. When it decomposes, arriving on our coasts, it, it releases a different gases, um, which are toxic. The one you can smell is hydrogen sulfide. It smells like rotten eggs, and you really don't want to be close to it. But there's other gases in there as well that are toxic for you, and you cannot smell them. People get um, problems with their eyes, with their ears, uh, with their noses and their throats from it. But they also get dizzy, um, get nausea, or, or get a headache when they are in these fumes for too long. It, it brings people um, difficulties breathing. And there's people who have long-term effects which haven't been studied much yet. Because some people, their houses are close to these places that get these large amounts. And they have these fumes day in and day out for several weeks, if not months, a year. But it also has other effects. So when the sargassum comes close to shore and it cannot reach shore and makes um, a carpet on the, on the um, shallow um, base, it can take out all the oxygen in that bay, which means every single animal living in the bay such as fish, small critters, turtles, they all die, which can be a natural catastrophe. Furthermore, um, some other places like the Barbados and Guyana, they have seen huge reduction in their fisheries due to sargassum. Barbados does flying fisheries, and the flying fish cannot fly out of the water in sargassum patches. And Guyana is trawling for shrimp, which is also not possible with sargassum. So those fishers, a lot of them have lost their income and livelihoods. Um, a really big impact is also on tourism. No tourist wants to be on a beach with smelly seaweed. So tourism has decreased in these places during sargassum season. For example, Mexico has seen a reduction of 30% of its tourism in the Mayan coast, the most important tourist area of Mexico. And of course, it also affects um, other ecosystems such as seagrasses and coral reefs that are very close to shore. I myself have seen the seagrass dying on my own island and it, you just go snorkeling and there's just stumps of seagrass where there should be lots and lots of seagrass um, growing. And that's an important nursery habitat for fish. And it's very sad to lose that and it will have impacts on fisheries and tourism if it happens. But people are trying to, to um, work with sargassum and actually remove it. So to make sure that these bad effects don't happen, you have to remove it as fast as possible. It starts decomposing about, for, about 48 hours after landing. So if you remove it beforehand, it may not be a health hazard. And there's different strategies. You can see in the top right, uh, top left, a boat that is removing sargassum out at sea and a barrier that makes sure it doesn't even get to the beach. This is possible to do in places where the water is calm. And, and a lot of areas with tourism, but also with locals, are going for this strategy. If you don't have that much sargassum, you could remove it by hand, either with rakes or just as they are doing here, or you could get a little um, surf raker and remove it like that. But when it gets really bad and you're not able to make a barrier, often the removal is done with heavy machineries on the beaches. 
which isn't good for the beaches themselves because of course it does a lot of damage there too but in the end it's the only way how to deal with these really large masses of it arriving at some point um this removal cost the Caribbean about $120 million a year. And most of the removed sargassum ends up somewhere on a pile on the island and is rotting away on its own or drying out and it's not being used. So that money is invested, but nothing comes out of it except that you have a clean beach. But there's people who are changing that. There's lots of people who are making products from cardboard and paper to fertilizers and compost. In the Dominican Republic, they even figured out how to make single use plates using sargassum. And in Mexico, a man um, combined sargassum with clay to build entire houses. Another Mexican company makes um, shoes out of sargassum and plastic that's from the ocean. And several companies are making soaps and beauty products because sargassum has very good um, um, antiviral and antioxidant um, components that you can take out and make products for us. You have to be very careful though because it also accumulates a lot of bad things that we have put into the ocean like arsenic and chlordecone and can be toxic if you don't treat it right. So you have to be careful with using it as a fertilizer. Um, make like these companies make sure that the arsenic content in their fertilizer isn't too high to use on your plants. And you also probably shouldn't eat the sargassum straight from the ocean because it could be quite toxic for you. These companies are mostly still very small and hopefully they're growing, but there's still a lot of sargassum that hits the beach at the beaches that is not used yet. But with the podcast, we want to change this and we want to exchange information and make more people aware of solutions so they can make those solutions on their own um, islands. Here is just a really cool graphic showing what you can do out of one ton of fresh sargassum. For example, you could feed 99 sheep for a week, or you could grow 114 mushrooms. You could make over 2,000 pairs of shoes or over 44,000 soap bars. Um, you could make uh, about 180 sargo blocks or almost 5,000 biodegradable single-use plates. So your options are endless and there's so much more we can make out of sargassum. Just think about bioplastics. So there's lots of um, companies figuring out what we can make out of this and starting new products every day. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you about is carbon sequestration. So you probably know that we have to reduce our carbon emissions rapidly, which you can see as the red line here. But do you also know that we have to start taking carbon out of the atmosphere so we can reach our targets? That's the blue line here. So by 2030, we should be able to take out 0 0.5 petagrams of CO2 per year. And by 2050, that should be 5 petagrams of CO2 per year. At the moment, we are at zero from like what we are doing right now. Of course, the, we are taking out CO2 through um, trees, but we have to increase that. So how can we do that using nature? Most people know about land plants and trees and that planting trees is a carbon solution and it will take out carbon from the atmosphere. And yes, a lot of carbon is stored in our land plants, 560 petagrams. 
And some of that is every year um, put into the soil and is sequestered there for a long time and kept there. But a lot of people don't know about blue carbon, the mangroves, the salt marshes, and the seagrasses. They don't have as much um, carbon stored in them as the land plants because they are in a much smaller area, but they can store more carbon per square meter than a land plant. And their soils being wet can take up an infinitive amount of carbon, which makes it really important to restore these ecosystems and also not to destroy the ones who are already there to make shrimp farms and other things. Then the people who know about, about blue carbon, they often don't know about algae. Because the reason that algae isn't in the blue carbon, even though it does take up carbon or CO2 from the atmosphere and thus sequester it straight down into the deep sea often, is because of accounting. Algae are not, um, algae are attached either to rocks or free floating like sargassum. So, unlike the trees, the mangrove, salt marshes, and seagrasses, the carbon may not be sequestered right there where um, it is grown. So it's really hard to give somebody credit for the carbon because do you give the credit to the person who has the land where the algae is grown or the person who has the land where the, the carbon is put into the soil? And that is why when, you, when people talk about blue carbon, they don't talk about algae even though algae is probably the biggest blue carbon source there is, taking down more carbon than mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses together. And today I wanna to tell you about the potential of pelagic sargassum. So that big um, macroalgae bloom you saw, that is 10.1 petagrams of carbon. So if we could use that instead of just taking it from our beaches and put it on a pile where it rots and the carbon goes back into the atmosphere, if we would make products that last very long, or if we would enhance the amount that is reaching the, the deep sea, then we, would, we could capture a lot of carbon. There's still a lot of research to be done. We don't even know how much of the sargassum goes to the bottom naturally and is already doing its job. And of course, we would have to figure out um, products to make that store the carbon, such as biochar, or how to put it in the deep sea without hurting the deep sea environment. But because sargassum has such, is, is growing so fast, and so much of its um, biomass is carbon compared to trees and mangroves and seagrasses and salt marshes. It has a huge potential. And I just want to finish the presentation by saying sargassum isn't the only seaweed out there. Macroalgae or called or seaweeds like fungi are on the rise. We are rediscovering them as the new champions of our natural world. We are figuring out what we can do with them from animal feed over our own food, lots of pharmaceuticals, adjectives, biopackaging, cosmetics, biostimulants, biofuels, and ecosystem services such as carbon capture. That's why the Seaweed for Europe Foundation um, thinks that um, the Euro European seaweed industry will scale up. There's a potential market of 9.3 billion by 2030, and it could mitigate over 5 million tons of CO2 per year and absorb a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus from the ocean as well, which is a huge problem because all the agricultural runoff, of course, ends up in the ocean it could become a really cool ecosystem because when you grow seaweed somewhere, 
you will attract fish, you will have this really beautiful ecosystem I told you about in the beginning and be a nursery ground for our marine species, which are suffering a lot right now. And the really cool thing about seaweeds is you don't need fresh water to, to grow it. You don't need fertilizer to grow it. You don't need to clear land. If you're thinking about carbon capture, if you're growing a forest and that forest gets burned by forest fires, you're losing your investment. You're losing your carbon capture. I haven't seen um, seaweed burn yet in the ocean. So I think in that case, and also because it grows it faster and you can pretty much harvest the carbon within a year, um, there's a huge potential for the carbon capture with seaweed. And it will create lots of jobs for different skilled and experienced profiles and also help island nations who have a lot of ocean, but not much land. So for me, seaweeds are one of the solutions we need for climate change. And that's why I love telling people about it because it's a solution that is not well known to people, but everybody should know about this and should be excited about this. Because hopefully, seaweed will be one of the champions who helps us tackle this huge problem we have. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you became curious about sargassum, we have a new episode coming out every Monday. And we interview scientists, locals, artists, you name it, all kinds of different stakeholders lots of entrepreneurs to go really in deep on, in depth on their knowledge on sargassum and their solutions. So tune in and have a nice day. I'll tell you what, that is just the most amazing, amazing talk ever, Francisca. Thank you. So you're saying when we watched the talk that you delivered on Saturday night and one of the professors from um, the university, Tony, said that 20,000 tons of sargassum would remove, uh, it would, would, is 10 billion tons of carbon. And he says that's 40 billion tons of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere. It's the annual equivalent of all the fossil fuels burned on the planet in one year. Yes, but of course it's it's in, the carbon is just in the biomass of the sargassum. So it will also go out of there. And the question is, how does it go out of there? If you take all that sargassum and you may capture it, like you, you sink it to the deep sea, I'm not saying that's, that's per se a good idea because we also want to take care of our deep sea or you make biochar out of it, which I think will capture half of that CO2 or carbon, mm -hmm. then you could capture a lot of it. But at the moment, it's not captured. It's going back into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's just in the sargassum for a while. Like the same with our plants. They have 560 petagrams of, um, of carbon in it, so much more than the sargassum, like 56 times more. But that doesn't mean that that all gets captured, only really maybe 3% of that carbon in the plants gets captured into the soil. So really what we have to figure out is how to capture that carbon that gets into the sargassum. But, but yeah, for me, the sargassum, it's it's caused by climate change or mm -hmm. one of the causes is climate change mm -hmm. but it's one of the few things that's caused by cl climate change that can also help us solve our climate change problem so what i was talking to robert mckay about um he's one of the gentlemen that gives us advice he's from a group called brand new day and he is just desperate to meet you. I mean, he he begged me. He begged. He said, I, I, I've got to be on that on that sustainable schools virtual summit with Francisca. I said, no, 
no, not going to happen. He said, please, I need to speak to her. And I said, look, we'll have to make an arrangement for another time. <laughs> so I, you know that we, we were going to bed and he was messaging me going, that I just can't sleep. <laughs> that lady's <laughs> talk, that talk was just the best ever. And then we woke up in the morning and he was like, Mel, I can't, I woke up and all I can think about is sargassum. <laughs> <laughs> so what we've done with Educate Global, which you may be interested in is, and we're gonna launch this, this goes live on the 24th of March. We, um, when we start, we have the Bronze Award where we introduce, we have the climate, the sustainability and climate literacy teams because they need to give that, get that, the grounding, the basics mm -hmm. of climate literacy, right? We're not, because it's all well and good for me to say, to her, here we go, here's the SDGs, right? But I have no clue what, how those SDGs impact on me and my community and my stakeholders. I don't have a clue. I have to have that, that grounding. I've got to have those mm -hmm. foundations. We call them the foundations. And that, for Educate Global, we are M-A-T-T, -T, Mitigation Adaptation. So Bronze and Silver Awards, Mitigation Adaptation. Gold Award, Transition. Yes. And Platinum Award, Transformation. So we find that Everybody talks about adaptation and mitigation, but nobody's talking about actual solutions. So we've been working on delivering the carbon literacy teacher training, which is in our gold award. And that school, when I share this with them, I know that their head teacher is going to be arranging for you to deliver a talk for all of the students in her school. Claire, you're watching this? Yes. Francisca, I will, you've got her email. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Francisca, you are aware that there are going to be a lot of head teachers beating a path to your door <laughs> because I think that your talk is just mind blowing. It's incredible. It's incredible. So I said to Robert, okay, I thought that Francisca's talk was just the bee's knees. I need you to write a feature article, interview her and write a feature article about her. And let's put it onto our, um, our news desk. So we have something called um, PR for your school, for the gold awards. And every one of the schools that do our gold award, they get their very own media portal. And they can send out up to any, any press, as many press releases as they want a month to up to a million journalists around the world. So, Please get ready because these students are going to be <laughs> writing lots of articles about this talk and about you. They're going to be interviewing you. I'm going to, I did some homework because I watched your TEDx talk. And if with your permission, may I include that below this talk? Of course. I love my TEDx talk. I think it's very important to, to get that message out. I mean, you know, you have no idea. I mean, your ears have been burning since Saturday, I'm <laughs> sure they have, because I've already scripted your own TV series. With oh my God. Character. I've already, you know, Robert and I are going, okay, that's it. Where does Francisca go now? And we've got, <laughs> we, I'm like, right, how do we animate her? Do you think she'll give, she'll give us permission to have illustrators draw her? Because we have to turn her into this superhero <laughs> so your ears your ears will be on fire <laughs> yeah i mean if you if you really want to make a tv series i think you would have to make it about robbie our other co-host because first of all he's much more of a character and he he works with all these indigenous groups making educational materials in their own languages about science and turning indigenous languages into the language of science and laboratories and in schools and I think his life and his adventures would be way better for, for a yeah, TV I think, series. I think what we'll have to do, friends, is just get both of you. Now that you, I mean, you've done the hard sell on him. So <laughs> he has no <laughs> choice now. <laughs> I sent you both an email straight after. I was like, right, I need you both. Right, Robbie, I need your lessons. Francisca, 
I need you both to do a talk. So I will, I will, I will, I'll capture him. He's not, he hasn't, he hasn't, he has no idea. You're going to call me the Mel Sargassum person because I just want to know the lot. I wanted to ask you, you had a very interesting, you've had a very interesting career so far and you're still very young. You're still very young. And what is it about this that you feel is you've made this your life's work, just like I've made my life's work upskilling teachers to teach climate change, carbon literacy, transition engineering, transformation. Why did you make this your life's work? What was it? Um, why sargassum, you mean? Yeah, why, how, did, how did this take over your whole world? Um, well, uh, to answer in a more funny way, um, I used to teach um, study abroad students in the Caribbean. And at, at the end of each semester, we would give each other paper plates awards. And one time I got a paper plate award that I would be the first, uh, I would um, go to a conference in a shark costume because I went to the um, camping trip in a shark costume. And I had a conference coming up a few weeks later. So I actually presented my talk in a shark costume. <laughs> and then, yeah, later on when I started researching sargassum and I got really excited and really passionate about it, my paper plate award was that I'm going to, save the world using sargassum so now i'm just working on that assignment if you want to stay i bet you the children must say oh, there, there goes that sargassum lady <laughs> <laughs> yes but um i mean it's not my life's work yet i've literally only worked on sargassum for two years now um but yes um i was taking a sabbatical last year so all of last year and actually this year um, I work without payment or almost no payment. Um, we still don't have any sponsors for our podcast. So if anybody knows somebody who wants to, to um, put in money to us, give us a grant, give us some sponsorship. We, we do advertisement on the podcast. Please let us know so that we can pay me and others doing the work. Um, but I was working on climate change. And sargassum is something that I can work on professionally next to just going in the streets and protesting and, and doing lots of talks about climate change that may make a really big difference. And that's why I'm so passionate about sargassum and educating people about it. Uh, it's very interesting that um, uh, we, we often get people beating a path to our door here at Educate Global, Denise and I, and they, are, they just refuse to believe us that we have had no sponsorship whatsoever, that we've, that we've no funding. They just can't they, can't, they can't reconcile that we've done all of this on our own. They just can't get their heads around it. And uh, my husband still hasn't forgiven me because you know we live very frugally but our my whole world is this my, my life is educate global and getting it out to as many schools as possible and it's the schools that pay you know just for the administration just to keep us going the more schools that come in they pay the admin fee and and i don't know how we do it but we somehow just keep going every month and it's like people just don't realize, you know, we, when we first launched, we created the climate change teacher course and we had to pay the UN. We paid the UN for a joint portal <laughs> and people don't believe us. <laughs> so no, we paid them. <laughs> and we have more than, gosh, we have almost, God, 300 and I think it's 349,000 schools in 43 countries now. And People just think you must be making billions and you just think, well, no, because we paid for that. We sponsored that. We have now got with our awards, we have schools that are they starting to pay for their bronze and their silver. And we find that it's mostly private schools that are paying for the gold awards. But the interesting thing is one of our first gold award schools, the head teacher is sponsoring eight state schools. So 
it's that is that is powerful for me because when when a private school learns this knowledge and then they share they become an exemplar in their community and they go right we've been taught how to be carbon literacy specialist teachers we're now and then they say to me okay so what's next <laughs> I said, what do you mean what's that and the head teacher said well we've remapped our curriculum it's a completely cross-curricular climate curriculum what's next and I said okay well hang on hang on I've got the I've got the MIT En-ROADS teacher training coming I'm busy fixing that and then we've got the transition engineering GCSE we're nearly there we're nearly there <laughs> just give and then after that we're working with um University of California Irvine and that is going to be the Peaceful Planet teacher training. That's very exciting. And we've got, we've had the, um, uh, my goodness, it's something, some mediators beyond borders and a professor, Shara Lee Graydon, and she's busy creating lessons for children as the precursor to prepare them for um, international environmental law and conflict resolution and peace. So there's so much that we're working on and we are, we're, we're spending all the hours that there, that there are night and day. We realized something the other day, Francisca, that to make the boat go faster, we have to join together. There mm -hmm. is no other way. We, we, there's, there's no way we are going to fight this fight unless we throw our egos out of the window and we join together. There can be no leaders in this fight. We, it's yes. like a fire. Have, I don't know if any of our viewers or listeners, I remember as a little girl fighting a, what we call a felt fire. You can hear my accent. I was raised in South Africa. It's a field fire. It's a bit like what they have in Australia. And you just, all you do is you have these wet sacks and you, and you just beat the flames because you have to put them out. And, and you are, you're almost operating on autopilot and there's a, there's a row of you with firefighters and you just know that you cannot let that fire spread. So I've had that experience of working in a team and there's no ego because you are all together in, in, in that one line together fighting that fire. And that's how I see us all working together. We are busy putting together a mega consortium and I would like for you and Robbie to join that, please, Francisca. We, we're putting together a massive UK transatlantic consortium, and we are hoping to raise the funds for that consortium so that we will be a very big group that are all working on climate literacy, carbon literacy, um, actual proper solutions, you know, so solvers. And I think that's probably my role in meeting you is getting you into the consortium and helping you raise the funds, the research and grant funding to help you do your research and get this out to a much wider audience. I'm working with um, Nottingham Trent University and Warnborough College in Ireland Reutlingen in universe, uh, University in Germany, Kosminski University in Poland, and the uh, Malta Water and Energy Board on another consortium. And we're just waiting. We put forward a funding bid for the EU Horizon 2020 fund. So if we get mm -hmm. that, and I think we, we probably, and we should, because it's, if I send you the, I'll send you the summary. Actually, guys, I'll put the summary below and you can all have a look at it that was sent out to potential um, members of our advisory board i mean we have a great advisory board i mean mm -hmm. I, I even wrote to one of the uh, Mon monsignor uh, crotty he's one of these the ambassador to the vatican and i said monsignor crotty please please help me you've got to help me here i need somebody on my advisory board that people are going to look after and go Oh my word, if they've got him on the advisory board, they've got to give them the help. So I'm sure we're going to have a chat about that. I'm going to speak with you and Robbie about that afterwards. Francisca, I want to ask you, what advice could you give to our students that are want to make a business? They potentially are entrepreneurs. If they could go to one of these islands and start harvesting the sargassum or harvesting it direct from the ocean before it gets inland, what do you recommend they do? Who, who should they talk to? Should they talk to you? Should they talk to 
Are there going to be lectures about this? Is there going to be, you know, showing them like a website, showing them all the businesses and the opportunities there are to harvest the sargassum? Um, well, first of all, they should listen to our podcast to learn a lot more about it. And there is a document from the FIO that summarizes the uses of sargassum. So it summarizes the different companies that are already working in it, the challenges you have, because there is the heavy metal challenge, there's the challenge of you don't get the same amount every year, the challenges of how do you take it off the beaches and where do you process it because you have you know, small islands and, and so on. So it's not that easy. And the other thing you should really do is, you know, this resource kind of belongs to the local people who are on these islands. Like they're the ones suffering from it nowadays, but they're also the ones receiving it and they should be the ones who, who profit from an industry. And the Caribbean people, are very proud they should be they're very creative they're amazing people amazing culture but what happened to them a lot like over and over the centuries is people from outside come in and tell them what to do or take what is theirs and and use it for themselves and i really hope that 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 doesn't happen with sargas and the people who who are excited now who are not living in the caribbean Yes, you can be part of the solution, but you have to go and spend a lot of time listening to local people to what are they doing already? Where are is the problems? What do they want to do with it? And then help them with the things they need help with mm -hmm. and, and have them lead it, not have you lead the way, but be, give them the resources that you can give them for them to to help to solve that problem. I'm sure there are many investors listening or watching this and are busy going, ooh, this is an investment opportunity. Have you delivered a talk from the OECS? Have you met Lisa? The Caribbean no. Island? I'm going to connect you with Lisa because I think you need to be doing a talk for the OECS down there. I think they are going to absolutely go nuts when they see this. I'm going, as soon as we're finished with this one now, I'm going to message her now and say, you have just got to speak to this lady. It's incredible. What you are doing is incredible. I think that this is going to provide jobs, prosperity, um, hope for so many people in those islands that where they are living there if this is what if somebody can invest and help them to set up their businesses and we can use this but we can get the value from it from the carbon the carbon you know if we can get it to be sequestering that, that carbon that would be amazing i know it's it's one chink in in the armor that is the climate emergency. But I think if we can each be hacking away at just one chink each, we can absolutely pull off that chain mail, smash it to bits and have a fantastic future and make sure that we bring, we can, like you said, it's gonna take us a long time to absorb that carbon that's already in the atmosphere. But we want to be, we want to be good ancestors, all of us, because yes, one day exactly. our children and our grandchildren or our great grandchildren will say, oh, my goodness, that Francisca, she's my great great granny. She was just the coolest lady ever. <laughs> she was the one that was, you know, getting this other mad woman called Melanie Howard over in the United Kingdom. So excited about sea algae and seaweed and sargassum. So that's what we want. We want people to be saying, and, and, we, and you've got to write a book, Francisca. You've got that's to write what, a book. That's what my boyfriend says all the time. And I tell him you've already wrote a PhD a thesis. <laughs> you, you've got to write a book. Write a book about all of this because this is incredible what you're doing. And if we can do all we can to help. I'm looking forward to working with you.
I'm really looking forward. Well, if you'll have me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's another thing altogether. It's probably going, I, I bet you now she's busy. Uh, folks, she's on her WhatsApp and she's messaging Robbie going, don't even speak to this nut job. If you no. do, I have no to say, look, Robbie, quick, get any excuse to get me out of here. The door is open. I've got to get out. <laughs> no, I'm no, really no, I'm we, looking forward to it, Francisca. I think we are, you are, yeah. you're we are very excited to work with you um, for sure. And um, Robbie is as well. And yes, you're totally right. Like we have this huge um, responsibility to act in these next 10 years or nine, nine years now because now um, now for, yeah but now we can't wait yes. for nine, 10 years. now we no no now. Uh, yeah we have to start acting today and we have to keep acting the next 10 years because that's all the time we have left so i don't think people we, realize they don't know the they, yeah the people alive today we may be the most important ancestors they ever had. Like, yes, there's the people who figured out what is poisonous to eat and what isn't. They're really important. The people who made really delicious recipes, making it um, possible for us to digest our food easier so we can use our energy thinking, super important. But if we don't do our job right now, then... Well, everything that the other ancestors worked for is for nothing. So we have this huge responsibility and it is super scary. Um, but it's also exciting to have such a big role and and to to try to live up to it and actually do it, at least to me. Oh, to me too. I'm really, I, I, I'm so excited. And if anybody is interested, you've got Francisca's, you've got the podcast, go and listen. And what I'll do, as Francisca, I'll actually put a link to your podcast below on this page. I'm going to share this page like you've never seen before. I'm going to build you your own page. I've got all your bio. I've got your links. I've, I want the links to that. And I'm going to push this out on social media to all of our schools around the world. Every single Educate Global Award School in the world should be knowing about this and should be teaching about this. And, you know, I mean, your, your presentation, your PowerPoint, may we have your PowerPoint, is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Great, we're gonna, we get, folks, if you're a teacher in a school, Francisca's been bullied into giving that away. It's going to be here below and you can start using this in your lessons and telling children about the sargassum bloom, what's going on and why it's happening. Because it's as a result of climate change, isn't it, that we've got that? Yeah, not only climate change, um, but one of the drivers likely is climate change, like the warmer sea temperatures and the change of the currents. Well, I want to thank you, Francisca, and I am also going to get you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at everything that you have, and we're going to hustle you like you've never been hustled before. She's going to just say, no, please, these educate global schools, I can't handle this. But everybody, if you want to know more about the Sustainable Schools Virtual Summit, our email is support at educateglobal.org. That's two C's, two in Educate Global, E-D-U-C-C-A-T-E-G-L-O-B-A-L.org. And if you want to get hold of Francisca, her email is here and it'll be in the podcast, in the um, transcription of it. All of this will be transcribed. You can read it, you can print it, you can share it. You need to go and deliver lessons on her work. Track her down. Um, don't fly to her where she is, please. We're not flying. Write to her. She would love some letters. She would love any support. Send her lots and lots of cash. That would be great. Um, <laughs> but she needs to keep going. They need to be funded. They need help. And help all of us work together. We're going to put this consortium together. It's going to be a mega uh, UK and transatlantic consortium because we are going to be raising funds and sponsorship so that we can do research and support groups like Francisca and Robbie 
and all of those because we need more research on this we need we need evidence we need videos we need lessons we need every single thing that we can throw the kitchen sink at okay all right everybody i want to thank you so very much for joining us today francisca you've been an absolute joy thank you it's been yes. incredible Thank you. And for anybody who doesn't have money to throw at us, that's totally okay. But if you can subscribe to our social media, to our YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast um, on Apple Podcasts or iTunes and leave us a review there and five stars, that will help us tremendously to, just to grow and to, for other people to find us and to learn about Sargassum. Thank you, Francisca, and I'll see you all on the other side.